Потом что мама здесь. Моя мама. You здесь. Папа. Thank you for loving me. Bye. Finding the right jeans is hard. Accepting your jeans is even harder. Whether you wear boyfriend or boot cut, high rise or low rise, this podcast will teach you to love the jeans you are in. I'm Rachel. And I'm Tina. And we're going to use modern research to bust diet myths and get real about body after baby. We're going to take you on a journey of unpacking your old beliefs about food and weight so you can learn to nourish your body and raise body confident kids. So put your booty in a chair and let's talk mom jeans. Hey everyone, welcome to today's Mythbusters episode. Today we are switching gears from busting myths about adult bodies and chatting about kids by busting the myth. Boom boom. Here it is. Kids today aren't healthy. Oh, how dare you? Today's myth is one that most parents are so confused by. Are their kids healthy? Is the food that we are feeding our kids nourishing them? Are kids today too sedentary? Should parents be doing something about their kids' health? Oh, this is obviously a complicated myth. So many questions and so much confusion. It's a complicated myth because we have to really completely pull apart multiple layers about the food industry, about weight and BMI, and really the overarching concept of what is health. So... To simplify it, we're going to just stick with the latter, the overarching concept of health and how this myth has narrowed pediatric health to just diet and exercise. We're going to give you a brief history about this myth, and then we are interviewing author and a passionate myth buster herself on kids' health, Virginia Soul Smith. So this myth has way too deep of a history to dive into, and we only have... 40 or so minutes, but some of the earliest research on children's health that we uncovered goes back to the 1870s when children's hospitals began to form, and up until then it was only adult hospitals, and then seeking funding in order to study pediatric health and care for children. Only those with financial privilege could afford medical care for their children, and the rest of the children were left untreated in various levels of poverty at home or in orphanages, with atrocious childhood mortality rates and rampant childhood diseases. The first recorded lecture about childhood health came from Dr. Abraham Jacoby in 1860, and his vision was that pediatrics should concern themselves with child health well beyond mere diseases. He advocated for the involvement of doctors who treated children in all aspects of child health, including infant feeding, child hygiene, and disease prevention in well children. And at this time in American history, due to the wave of immigration occurring in America at the time, part of the, his lecture points included teaching doctors how to facilitate the Americanization of immigrants. We have been unable to find out if the work had a racist anti-immigration lens or if it was truly to facilitate developing healthy communities and access to medical care for immigrants. So if you guys end up doing your own sleuthing and find out more, please let us know because we always want to touch on the social justice lens because so many messages about health are rooted in racism and xenophobia. Anyways, the point is that the research began to occur during this time in history Broader conversations about childhood health that expanded beyond just disease care, but more into disease prevention, began to occur. So, for example, nurses and charitable workers began learning about and then teaching parents on the importance of milk for infants, on how fresh air and activities foster physical and mental health in children, and then they also began to form community clinics. Fast forward to the 1960s and 70s when growth charts were developed and research from mostly white children to assess if a child was growing adequately. In 2006, the charts were redesigned after taking a more global census that did control for a few various aspects, but the data analysis was not perfect. Too much to go into there. We will link an article for you. And the charts do admit a few key imperfections. One is that the norm for 
quote unquote, a healthy infant was based on a breastfed infant, not a formula fed one. And the data admitted that healthy children did exist outside of the bell curve that was developed and those points were thrown out of the data collection. And the CDC and WHO have separate renditions of growth charts that are often in opposition. Ooh, I'm angry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. And you'll hear Virginia talk more about this, but basically given the small population that the growth chart was developed from, we always beg the question of, is BMI even appropriate then to be used on children today? Does it show appropriate body diversity or diversity in general? Yeah, or are we continuing to stigmatize and have fat phobia by using this in our children as a quote-unquote measure of health? The bottom line is that kids that maintain their own growth curve can be healthy at any size. Throwing in once again the Poodle Science video, and we'll link that because it's just so good. So good. The topic of children's health has become a political issue for both parties in history. In 2010, President and First Lady Obama developed the Let's Move campaign, campaign, or task force, as it was called, to okay, fight childhood obesity. That's in quotes. You should see my face. <laughs> While we are not taking any political standpoints here, we are noting that when a large public platform takes on health initiative and uses weight stigmatization in its key phrases, it can impact an entire nation's viewpoints. That's true. A little psychology there of how it can impact people's viewpoints. So while we appreciate the social justice components the campaign focused on regarding parental education and nutritional support in schools, it still puts the burden of children's health solely on a children's size, food intake, and exercise regimen. We truly believe that health is a much broader conversation than this, and that is the part of the myth about kids' health that we're busting today. We wanted to chat a little bit about correlation versus causation. As mentioned above, there are many layers of health, and we truly believe that anyone's weight or amount of fat on their body cannot be a behavior. It is a symptom from something or just a natural aspect of their body. Health is a bigger picture that includes access to food, resources, financial privilege, cultural norms, location of living, mental health of the family or individual, medical diagnosis, and so much more. We also believe that a key foundation to health is teaching body trust and body autonomy. These are so quickly taken away when the children are abused, controlled, lectured, ridiculed, bullied, and told they are wrong in so many ways. A healthy child is more than a number on the scale. It is a child who can be in their body with confidence and self-respect, regardless of their abilities, size, race, or socioeconomic status. I want to throw in the analogy, which I feel like is really helpful, talking about correlation and causation. We've mentioned it in previous episodes, but I'll throw it out again. So the difference between correlation and causation is that Let's say that in the summer, statistics show that ice cream sales increase, but so do murders. And so if we're talking about causation, then you're saying that uh, murderers really like to eat ice cream or ice cream, eating ice cream in the summer causes people to murder people. And the reality is, is mm, I don't think that either of those are true. I just think that it's correlation that both are happening at the same time but one doesn't necessarily cause the other i don't know my children might murder each other to get first in line for the ice cream truck but (laughs) that is possible i'm not saying it's not possible depends on your age but we're just saying not definitively (laughs) children are not murdering each other to get in the ice cream line yeah all right we're gonna dive into all this and also share some personal examples from all of us moms in our interview today. So let's go ahead and bust this myth with our interview. Woo-hoo. We are interviewing Virginia Soul Smith. She is the author of The Eating Instinct, Food Culture, Body Image, and Guilt in America. She writes a column on food and body image for the New York Times parenting section and is the co-host of the Comfort Food Podcast. Let's do this. Well, welcome to our episode today, Virginia. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. We are so excited to have you help us bust this big myth about whether or not kids today are healthy. 
if we're raising a generation of healthy or unhealthy kids, what we should do about our kids if the pediatrician's giving us information about their weight or their health measures. So we're so glad you're able to join us and help us bust this myth for parents today. Absolutely. I'm excited. Could you start us off, share a little bit about who you are and why you're so passionate about helping us bust this myth today? Definitely. So I'm Virginia Soul Smith. I'm a journalist. I'm the author of The Eating Instinct, Food Culture, Body Image, and Guilt in America. I also write a monthly column for the New York Times parenting section on raising, quote, I'm putting it in quotes, healthy eaters, um, where I talk a lot about kids and food and weight and body image. Um, And I'm the co-host of the Comfort Food Podcast, where we talk about a lot more of the same. Um, And how this sort of all started for me is, you know, when my older daughter was born seven years ago, I absolutely wanted to raise a healthy child. You know, I had that mantra through pregnancy of the only thing that matters is a healthy baby, you know. I mean, I did actually really want a girl, which is a whole other thing, but I kind of claimed I didn't care about the gender. I only wanted a healthy baby, Um, all of that. And I was really fixated during that pregnancy on, you know, am I taking the right vitamins, like the best brand of vitamins? Am I, you know, getting enough omega-3s? And, you know, I really, we get this message that we're building a quote, healthy baby with literally every bite of food we take and every choice we make as pregnant women. So this was really something I was pretty obsessed with and also pretty sure I was doing right. But then my daughter Violet was born and when she was a month old, we found out she had a rare congenital heart condition. She went into massive heart failure and almost died. And then also completely stopped eating and was dependent on a feeding tube for the better part of two years. And this is really the moment when I was like, wait a second, like all this stuff, first of all, this crazy thing happened that really was beyond my control. But let me tell you, it took several years of therapy to accept that it was beyond my control because I'd been told that I was going to raise a healthy baby. And so, of course, it had to be my fault. I had to have done something wrong. And then also, it made me realize how much we place this moral value on healthy in a way that really is really ableist and really discriminatory towards kids who are you know, valuable human beings. And the fact that she was, quote, unhealthy because of her heart didn't make her any less essential to me as my child. So that was the starting point for the whole thing. I remember my aunt giving me that advice when I was pregnant because my cousin has spina bifida and her saying, even her telling me, be careful about even saying, I just want my baby to be healthy because she goes, I even got that advice. People told me that. And then how do you think that was able for me to like process and how, how did I feel when my baby wasn't quote unquote healthy, you know? And so it is ableist. And so that was always, that stuck with me years and years ago about that piece of like, I'm just going to love whatever it is. And I'm a good mom, no matter what. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And you can let yourself off the hook in a big way then, but you can also see your child for who they really are instead of putting all these labels on them and expectations. So while we're talking about this overarching theme of, well, not theme, it's a myth of my kid or kids today aren't healthy, a lot of times we're hearing other myths within that, which is my kid is fat, this is bad, or it's my job to raise um, a healthy kid or a kid that lives in a thinner body, which we're associating with healthy, right? So we're trying to bust that, um, those concepts. And so do you, what do you know about these myths, history or origination? Sure. Can you share with our listeners a little bit about that? Absolutely. So, you know, a lot of my reporting over the last seven years since this experience with Violet has been really focused on unpacking the connections between health and weight for kids. And there's a couple of things to keep in mind. I mean, one is that, you know, parents at all at both ends of the growth chart get this message about health and weight you know violet was very had lost a lot of weight during that month when her heart was shutting down so for her thin was definitely not better you know being underweight was extremely dangerous um but then at the other end you know my my second daughter who was born healthy typical leader is a 96 percentile kid and so we have pediatricians making comments on her at the end so i really live like both ends of the spectrum in a very real way And what we know about that spectrum that the doctors are using is that the growth charts were developed using data collected on mostly white children, mostly in the 1960s and 70s. So there's a very real question about whether 
the body mass index chart being used in pediatricians office even applies to kids today? Is it even relevant to, you know, the diversity of kids that we see today, the way that bodies have changed, not necessarily in unhealthy ways, but just changed because demographics in our country have changed. We're a more diverse population, food customs have changed, you know, we're not the country we were in 1963. So it seems weird to put that standard on our children. Um, what we know is that kids who maintain their own growth curve can be healthy at any size along that growth chart. We're not all supposed to be 50th percentile average size humans. Body diversity has always existed, even back in the 1960s it existed, um, and well before that, and it exists today as our country gets more diverse. So it's really important to take a step back from this idea that our children's weight communicate something about their health. Again, there are these situations like with my daughter Violet where of course a massive weight drop is really concerning. Or if a child makes a big weight change in the other direction, it can sometimes be a correlating symptom of you know, a condition like when kids develop diabetes, there's often weight shifts in one way or direction. But it's not the weight itself that's the problem in most of these cases. That's at best just a symptom. So it would be like taking someone who has lung cancer and saying, you know what, we're going to whiten your teeth. Those yellow teeth you have, that's the reason you have lung cancer. When in fact, like maybe they have yellow teeth because they smoked and they have lung cancer because they smoked, but the teeth were not the issue. That's just an aesthetic fact. And so similarly with weight, there are times where weight contributes to health. Absolutely, I'm not disputing that but there are more often times where it's just a correlating factor and we get really zeroed in on trying to control it. And the other reason that's super dangerous is because for children in particular, there aren't even really any effective weight loss methods in the long-term sense for adults. So prescribing weight loss or weight management for children is an extremely irresponsible thing to do. I wanna hit on few words that you just said. One it's irresponsible. I love that because it it really is. It's harmful. It it is really something that yeah, weight loss even for adults is harmful, but we're talking about growing children. And so as parents that are ultimately guiding this child who lacks insight into health and what their body actually needs and solely because their brain is not developed yet. It is our responsibility to teach them that. And so by putting them on a diet because we have internalized fat phobia is irresponsible. So I love that. The other piece I think is like, yes, you're speaking from a very weight inclusive framework. Weight is not the central reason. It is not a cause. It can be correlated, yes. The mantra I always use is that fat is not a behavior. Weight is not a behavior. It can be a symptom, so like in your two children that you're talking about or an individual, let's say with lung cancer, let's say they're losing weight or gaining weight or whatever it is, it's a symptom of something bigger, right? And so we need to really recognize that if we're using weight as a behavior, then we're kind of missing the mark there and we're providing poor treatment and ultimately doing harm on our children's health. I think it's interesting that you do use the word irresponsible because I think the language that we hear a lot in our culture and in our society and even in the political landscape is that we're actually being irresponsible as a culture because of the fact that our kids are quote unquote obese. I mean, there's even a political initiative called the Task Force on Childhood Obesity, which sounds militant. You know, and and the whole goal is that we as caregivers and as parents have a responsibility in reducing the childhood obesity and a, a responsibility to raise healthier children. And we're, we don't want to mess up an entire generation because we have to have a healthy future for our children. And so I think the language gets really skewed. And so I like that you're offering an alternate. And I, I'm wondering, though, if you can talk a little bit about how that type of language has has really impacted the parenting and, and how parents are raising their children, wondering what to do. Oh, completely. I mean, it set this really unrealistic bar for parents. I mean, and that's what I was talking about in terms of that first pregnancy where I was sort of aspiring to this, like, I don't know, Gwyneth Paltrow goddess-like status as the mother um, of, you know, that like nobody can live up to. And, you know, it also means that we're missing the harm that we do when we have those expectations for ourselves and our kids. It's a really unrealistic ideal. Um, you know, something we haven't mentioned yet is that um, dieting is the number one, dieting in childhood is the number one predictor of future eating disorder risks. So, 
you know, again, it's not just that it's not going to work, it's that it's actively doing harm for most of these kids. Um, but I think the language around responsibility is everywhere and really hard to escape. And it is important that we start to reframe it for ourselves as like, actually, the way to be a responsible parent is to empower my child to trust their bodies, to respect my child's body, to radically accept my child's body in whatever size it comes in and whatever health status it comes in. And again, this is something I personally really struggled with. You know, it's difficult as I was sort of working through my own feelings of failure around having a child with a chronic medical condition. You know, there's often times where you feel like you're fighting your child's health and you're fighting for their health, but it can quickly become this battle. And I see this as well when parents are told to worry about their child's weight. It's suddenly like them versus the kid's weight, which is them versus the kid. And so we really need to get away from all of that language and focus much more on, you know, eating and movement and things as joyful family things we do together, but not negative, not, you know, singling anyone out because of their size. Um, and make, and really like weight just doesn't need to be a part of it. It doesn't need to be a part of how you talk about health with your kid. And it doesn't need to be a part about how you think about feeding your kid right. either. Can you give more specifics on the kid-friendly language? Cause like if a kid's bringing this up at home where let's say for example, they were at the doctor appointment and the doctor said you need to lose weight you, in whatever way they're delivering that message or the kid heard the doctor tell the parents your kid is fat you need to have them lose weight now the kid's bringing it up to the parents do you have any um feedback or guidance for parents on some of that kid-friendly language well first i think the conversation ideally would start before you have that horrible doctor's appointment yeah. um you know like in our house we talk a lot about all bodies are good bodies um all foods are good foods. And I look for sort of small ways to discuss this with my girls all the time. So if we're reading a book, you know, children's literature is really problematic. There's a lot of fat characters that are evil or the fool or, you know, I mean, so if I notice that in a book we're reading, I'll say, hey, you know, I really don't like how they're talking about that person's body. Peppa Pig is my, ugh, the way that they talk about daddy pig's body. There's a lot of fat shaming in Peppa Pig. And with my three-year-old, I just said the other day, they Peppa made a joke about her daddy's big tummy. And I said, oh, but I like daddy pig's big tummy. And my three-year-old goes, oh, I do too. Oh. And I was like, okay, yes, Aww. there it is. <laughs> We're getting it. Um, so, you know, you want your kids to be used to the fact that in your house, there are no bad bodies. They're not hearing negative talk about bodies. And in fact, not just that they're not hearing the negative talk, but that they're actively hearing you say all bodies are good, fat bodies are good. Um, and so that's sort of a foundation. And then when it does come up, you know, then I think, of course, you're gonna have to tailor this to the age of your child. Um, but <clears throat> you can say afterwards, you know, I really don't like how the doctor talked about bodies in that appointment. You know, in our family, we know that all bodies are good bodies. I'm never gonna tell you to change your body size. You know, we're not gonna worry about that piece of it. And just really straight out say to them, like, this is not our family value. This is not what I'm expecting of you. Um, what I would not do is be dismissive of your child's experience, however. And this is sort of tricky, but you know, if a kid, let's say a kid is teased at school for their body size, um, or if a child says to you, am I fat? I think a place a lot of parents want to go with that is you're not fat, you're not fat, you're perfect, you know, and trying to sort of reassure like there's nothing wrong with your body, which is great. But if the child has already been labeled that way by other people or is experiencing for themselves, I am bigger than my peers, what you're, you run the risk of doing is erasing their experience. If you say, no, 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 you're, you're perfect, you're perfect, you're not fat. Instead, you want to say, you know, you are bigger than your peers, but there's nothing wrong with that. Your body is a great body. I, you know, I love your body. I love your belly. I love, you know, whatever it is that's come up. Isn't it sad that a lot of people struggle with this? Isn't it sad that a lot of people say hurtful things about bodies? We can do this differently. So you need to acknowledge that weight stigma exists and that this informs how we think about health, but make clear that you disagree with it and you will never apply that to your child. I think it's interesting that you bring up, it's not like you're pr putting a protective bubble over your child, right? It's not that you're not bringing in books, that it's like, well, this does have some fat phobic statements, right? Peppa Pig is making fun of their dad or whatever. I haven't read any Peppa Pig yet. I'm not, my kid's only two, but maybe we, sh maybe we should. 
maybe we should start, <laughs> right? Um, but it's that, hey, we're having this very transparent conversation because they are going to receive this messaging outside of your house. But if you've already done that pre-work in reframing that language with them, then they're better skilled and they have better tools to be able to challenge it when you're not with them. Another thing that I think you bring up, which is so, so important, and I want parents to hear, is that when we invalidate or erase the kid's experience, then we're ultimately saying that the way that they felt is bad, right? Like, oh, no, 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 you're not fat. I don't know what your friends are saying. You're perfect. So then now the kid is internalizing, well, fat is bad, right? So my parents are saying that I'm not, so I'm either fat or I'm perfect, right? I can't be both, right? Or someone says, oh, you're not fat, you're beautiful. So I can't be both. I can't be fat and beautiful at the same time. So it is really important to, you know, bring some reality to it. And so it, it is in the sense saying like, yes, your body is bigger and that is okay. And people may use the word fat or large or whatever. And that is ultimately descriptors. It's the same thing as you having brown hair and brown eyes and and whatever other descriptors you want to use. So it's really normalizing that language and depending on the age of the kid, having that appropriate conversation and being like, this may be something that you're going to be experiencing. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about strategies and comments and and reframes that you can use so that your feelings aren't getting hurt and you can acknowledge that this is you and your body is the way that it's supposed to be, right? Yes, absolutely. And what I would just add on to that too is these conversations are just as important to have with your thin children. And if you are a thin parent, um, you know, I often comment, like my girls know that I describe myself as small fat, you know, and they're kind of aware of that piece of it. But if I was a thinner mom, I would still be trying to have this conversation with them. And I have this conversation equally with my 20th percentile kid and my 96th percentile kid, because, you know, a couple of reasons. One, your thin child could grow up to be a less than adult. And so, you know, you don't want them to think that their thinness is like some kind of superpower or somehow innate to their personality. Thinness is a trait that can change and you want them to be okay with it if it changes. And number two, you know, they need to understand that they have thin privilege and that they may have their body more easily accepted. They may not face discrimination that other kids face and other people face. And so I see this very much as akin to the way white parents need to talk about racism. You know, dads need to talk about sexism. Like we all need to speak to all of these issues to help raise our kids to be more tolerant and open-minded and accepting. I think because this is a myth, we're looking at very stereotypical uh, spectrums when we talk about some of these myths, right? And I think there's one end of the spectrum where it, there's so much healthism. There are good foods and there are better foods and vitamins and exercise and all that jazz. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I think you're hearing the voices saying, well, look at the foods that we do have in our culture these days or the foods that are accessible when in the areas that are food swamps and look what's going on with this concept of health. And so I would love if you could help parents bust this myth because I think people fluctuate back and forth with what does it mean to have gentle nutrition in our home or joyful movement in our home and how do we help our kids be raised in balance or should we not worry about that balance and and I'm wondering if you could help parents kind of navigate when they're hearing these dueling messages. Sure so I think you know, one place to start might be to back up and say, well, what do we really mean? You know, what really does make up our health? And for some reason in our culture, we really boil health down, not only to weight, but specifically to nutrition and exercise. And we sort of act like there's nothing else that influences our health. When in fact, those are probably like, you know, if it's like a big pie chart, those are extremely skinny slices of the pie. And health, you know, like in my daughter's case, it was a genetic mutation that nobody could have controlled or prevented that really, you know, underscores her life trajectory of health in many ways. Um, you know, health is also, so there's genetics, there's biology, but there's also things like your socioeconomic status, your access to not just to healthy food, but to healthcare, to, you know, preventive medicine, to being able to afford your medicine. Um, there's the level of sort of chronic stress in your life, trauma, lived depression, all these other factors. So I think 
in some ways, this is a liberating message for parents because as much as it's really daunting that there's so much we can't control about our kids' health, it also means we don't have to try to control the things we can control to such an insane degree. And so I do reject this sort of idea that we want to be focusing on balance or moderation and teaching kids these skills around food because when you do that, you're automatically narrowing the way you think of health and you're narrowing the way you relate to your kid around health to like this meal by meal. You're living and dying by every meal at that point. You know, it's becoming this really um, sort of this thing that you have to manipulate and control all the time. And so I think a much better foundation for, to get away from nutrition and exercise, a much better foundation is to think, I'm trying to raise a child with body autonomy. I'm trying to raise a child who fundamentally trusts their body, listens to their body, and respects their body, and expects the world to listen to and trust and respect their body. If you do that, if you start there, you know, you're, you're automatically equaling, equalizing the playing field, right? Because anyone of any ability, any health background deserves body respect and body trust. And you're also taking a lot of pressure off that sort of micro controlling stuff around food, because we know that when kids trust their bodies and are able to listen to their bodies, they naturally can meet their nutritional needs, their movement needs. You know, we're removing the barriers that get in the way of that. When you fixate too much on are they eating, quote, healthy, that's when you set up the power struggles and the fixations and the scarcity mindsets that contribute to so many of the issues around food and health. So I think a lot of it has to do with just fundamentally changing the approach. And then that means that you don't live or die by what they, you know, last night for dinner, I think one of my children ate three peas and the other one, I carpet lint, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, we lost track. There was, it was one of those nights. Like you can't, you know, but it doesn't, like I don't track it. I, I can't tell you what they ate for dinner last night because that's not how I'm thinking about how I parent them or that's, you know, that's not a bar I'm measuring this by. Instead I'm thinking, you know, these are kids who, when they are hungry, reach, you know, gravitate to a nice mix of foods. They're learning to like new foods on their own terms. They're listening to their bodies. They trust their bodies. That's the starting point. Thank you for reframing that. Yeah, I think you're you're giving them the opportunity to build their own skills, right? If us as parents are micromanaging it or telling them when to eat, well, we, based off the division of responsibilities, when, where, what, but... But if we're telling them how much and if, then we're taking away their own autonomy, right? And we're telling them that I don't trust you, and so you shouldn't trust yourself. And the best skill that you can give your kids is letting them figure it out, right? Letting them get a stomach ache because they ate 10 pieces of candy or whatever. But they learn then. Uh, we are, I al always tell people we're teaching our kids to be 18 year olds that eventually leave the house and know how to do basic needs, right? So that they, so that no, we're not worried that they're going to be eating carpet lint um, and that they could ultimately make a basic meal. So um, it's going to look very different, but. I, I appreciate the fact that you're asking people to broaden their definition of health. It's not just about decreasing the video games and getting off the couch and increasing the vegetables. <laughs> like it is, right. there's mental health, there's spiritual health, there's physical health, there's emotional health, there's family health. There's so much else that we're really trying to help parents understand. And I love that you're going, look at the foundation being a much broader concept of body attunement and body trust. And then we look at what are the different factors that would go into that? Because it's much more than vegetables. Yes. By saying it's vegetables is ultimately, in one way or another, is kind of racist, right? It's saying that like, there's a part of me that thinks that it is because it's saying like, oh, well, we feel safe. We feel privileged. So our health is all about vegetables. But really, it's like there's individuals out here that don't have access to food, that don't even feel safe leaving the house, that go outside of the house and ultimately are experiencing these constant microaggressions that it, it is a bigger issue. And, and it isn't about, did you get your one to three servings? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right. I agree with that. Most often, no. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think also, you know, it's a really, um, it's a really paternalistic way to talk about health because it's assuming that if people aren't, quote, eating right or sort of measuring up to your idea of health, that it's because they don't know any better. That it's because, like, we have to go in with nutrition education and teach them all these things. 
Well, the fact is, like, if we raised up basic incomes, if people had access to good health care, if people weren't experiencing microaggressions on a daily basis, people know about vegetables. Like that, right. that message is out there. They don't need, yeah. they don't need a, anyone to teach them about vegetables. They need to be able to afford vegetables. They need to have a safe place to cook vegetables. They need to be able to afford to waste food when their child doesn't want to eat vegetables for, you know, the 42 exposures it takes. Like, there's a lot of things that, you know, when we go in with, again, this really narrow perspective of we're going to solve. And, you know, this is something that Michelle Obama brought to us with the Let's Move initiative. And so this is, you know, this is not a partisan thing. This is both sides of the aisle have done this. You know, she chose to fight childhood obesity instead of fighting childhood poverty. And in doing that, you know, all this messaging came through the schools, came from public health folks saying, you know, it's all about like, let's move and my plate and changing all of the, you know, this is, this is how we think about childhood health. When a lot of the parents of those kids would have done a lot better with, you know, more food stamps, more health care, all these other things. I think it's real, right? Where kids are getting the education almost too much, right? We're platforming these foods of saying these are green foods, red food, yellow foods. Like that information is not helpful, especially to children that are like, okay, cool. And I'm getting food from you guys, the school, and you're not even giving me vegetables, right? Because you don't have any money to give me vegetables. And when I go home, I certainly don't have any money to get access to that. You're lucky if dinner is being put on the table. So like this education is not helpful. I love how you kind of brought in the dichotomy of that. Like what actually would have been helpful is more access to food. If people can afford to eat well, they usually eat well. Like we've seen that over and over. And, you know, the other thing is those messages. Yeah, they're expecting kids to go home and like proselytize to their parents, which is a weird dynamic. Like kids don't buy the groceries. They don't make these decisions. So that's, you know, not very helpful because this isn't something the child can control. The other thing is it's not developmentally appropriate to teach nutrition in this granular way to little kids. Like little kids are really concrete thinkers. Nutrition is a highly nuanced, highly abstract concept that when you drill it down in this way, this is actually the subject of my most recent New York Times column, you know, when you drill it down in this way to kids, they're only going to come away with these really black and white, bad food, good food concepts, because that's how their brains work. So, you know, you're really pushing a message of health on them. And we all had that message pushed on us, right? Like we're living the consequences of this kind of education. So we can see it did not have the impact that they wanted, that it's in fact only led to really rigid, really entrenched thinking about food and bodies and health that doesn't serve us. So you know, there's lots of ways to talk about food with kids and talk about health with kids in a way that's age appropriate. You know, you can talk to them about how to plant an apple tree and the different parts of an apple. You don't need to tell them apples are better than cookies. Like, you don't need to go there. It doesn't have to be a moral lesson for them. It's so true. I see, especially with the middle schoolers that are being taught calorie counting, they're not developmentally ready for that. And next thing you know, I have these clients coming in going, well, the bag of pretzels says this number, and then this says this number. And I'm going, this is not simple math. This is advanced calculus or whatever I can try to do to make an analogy for them because they're not developmentally ready to start looking at numbers or understanding numbers. Even adults and professionals are trying to still figure out units of energy. So I think you're right when we're teaching it in these very simplistic ways to children that aren't able to handle the complexity of these concepts. It's just backfiring big time. I mean, let's even think of adults. I Exactly. It's not helpful, no. right? Like it's not, we, we are undoing this idea that calorie counting is a helpful tool for adults, why in the world would we be teaching that to children? I, I don't understand. One of the moms I interviewed for that column, she said her high schooler was given a calorie counting assignment. And she said the heartbreaking moment was like her daughter was really struggling with it, A, feeling bad about the food and to do the assignment. She was like, so I wanted to give her the easy way out. So I helped her download a calorie counting app. And I felt like I was giving her like the needle and the drugs, basically. You know, she's like, these are the apps that I have deleted off my own phone because I know how damaging they are. But it was like an easy way to get us through this assignment, you know. And of course, she talked to her daughter about it and she's not still using the app. But it, like, this is literally, you know, this thing that has caused so much harm for parents. Why, why on earth would we teach it to our kids? I think that flows into our last question about like, how can parents do this work themselves to challenge this myth about health or the narrow definition of health so that 
they are having a broader definition for themselves and then also not projecting onto their children? Well, for me, therapy was a real important. Um, so I'll give a shout out to that. Um, I can second that. Yeah. I, know it. Um, I think <laughs> that, and, you know, I say that jokingly, but it's true. I think a lot of us need to spend some time really digging deep on this stuff and having, you know, a weight inclusive health at every size mental health professional who can help you is a tremendous resource. Of course, that's not available to everybody, but if it is, certainly encourage people to pursue it. Um, but I think there's a couple of things we can do, you know, more concretely in our own lives. I made a pretty big commitment early on that my daughters would not hear me say negative things about food or bodies ever. And that felt really hard because, you know, when they were little, little, I was doing it all the time and I was catching myself and, you know, but once I made this sort of concert, it was when my older daughter, she was about two and she repeated back something I'd said. And I was like, oh dear God, you know, what am I doing? This isn't what I want her to hear. Forcing myself to do that for them really changed the narrative in my own head as well, because I had to, you know, and it took a while. It was like months of like sort of consciously catching myself, having a negative thought, stopping myself before I verbalized it. But then over time, the negative thoughts like got quieter. Like I didn't need to sort of stop myself so aggressively every time um, because I wasn't verbalizing it anymore. So I wasn't giving it the room. I think also curating your social media feeds is a really big one. Um, you know, I did a lot of aggressive unfollowing of accounts that push diet talk or push, you know, health equals thinness talk just to create more space in my brain. And it is amazing when you spend less time hearing that noise, you, it doesn't, it, you know, it frees you up in this huge way. So those were big ones. Um, the other thing, there was a nice study I reported on a few months ago that showed that even parents with eating disorders, you know, folks who are really, really struggling with these ideas for themselves, if they were able to avoid negatively talking to their kids about food and body, both in terms of how they talked about themselves and how they talked about their children, the children did much better. So I think there's a lot of hope that even if you're struggling, you don't have to pass this all on to your kids. Even if you can't necessarily change all your behaviors, even if they are sort of aware, like mom doesn't eat carbs and what's that about? You know, if they don't hear the negativity from you and if you really try to frame things positively to them, that will protect them. And I would argue that's also ultimately gonna be really good for you too. So it's, you know, it's very complex, it's multi-layered, but I think changing this narrative in our own heads for them and then for ourselves is definitely the first place to start. Yeah, I always use the analogy of like building a house where like the house is gonna change, right? You may bring it down to its studs and redo the interior or change up the furniture or whatever. And that's your kid's life, right? We can't really control it, but if the foundation is solid, that foundation can last through all these remodels. And that foundation starts with the parents, right? And so giving them those tools, that safe environment um, is such a great gift for them. But in order to do that, we have to do our own work. So, yeah. Yeah. And one other thing I just thought of, you know, with if you're dealing with a health issue with your child, um, if you're really struggling with feelings of guilt around that, like start to verbalize that because I would say I spent the first two years of my daughter's life secretly convinced that I had almost killed her, that this was all my fault and afraid to say that out loud because I was so sure my husband, my mom, everyone around me would be like, yes, we know. We all saw how you almost killed your baby. And obviously when I finally got to the point where I could say, hey, I think her heart condition is all my fault. Everybody around me was like, well, that's not true. <laughs> like scientifically not true at all. And you didn't do it and nobody's blaming you. And it was hugely liberating to have that experience. Um, so whether, you know, and of course there's gonna be times where someone may be blaming you. If it's about weight, they may be blaming you. Moms in particular get a lot of blame. But if you can find some safe person, whether that's a therapist, a doctor, somebody in your life who you can say, I feel really responsible for this. And they will say, no, it wasn't you. I will say it to you right now, listeners. It wasn't you, it's not your fault. I think that's really important. And like moms in particular need to hear that because we are so conditioned to think that whatever our kids are struggling with in any way that they're not measuring up to that idea of perfect health, that it's all on us and it's not. How can our listeners find you? Uh, VirginiaSoulsmith.com is where you can go to sign up for my newsletter um, and see latest articles. And I'm on Instagram and Twitter at V underscore Soulsmith, which is a 
bad handle I thought of before I started to say it on podcasts all the time. Um, and our podcast is Comfort Food. So that's anywhere you get podcasts. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. That is a wrap on this episode of the Mythbuster series, and we hope this information provides you with a more critical lens when you hear mainstream diet culture messaging. Please reach out to the person interviewed to connect with them in the ways they listed, or you can check out our social media pages at Mom Jeans the Podcast for details on the episode and to find our guests' information. And if you love the episode, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes and recommend this episode to a friend. Sending you the inner strength to accept your jeans with a G and wear the jeans with a J. Bye. This episode of Mom Jeans was produced and edited by Rachel Coleman and Tina LeBoy. Just a reminder, this episode is not a substitute for therapeutic counsel or nutrition advice. Thank you to Jerry DePizzo for the music production. You can find episode information and show notes at www.momjeansthepodcast.com. Follow us on Instagram at momjeansthepodcast and join the Mom Jeans the Podcast Facebook group to find a community of mamas learning to love their bodies and discussing the episodes. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Mom Jeans. See you next time.